Today, I'm very excited to introduce um, Virgie Koshar, who is a NASA scientist um, who was a postdoc with Aurorasaurus, but now is in the heliophysics department working on sprites and other transient luminous events. And she is going to explain what that means for us today. So I will turn it over to you, Virgie. And I'm okay. Yeah, thank you so much, Laura, for the introduction. Um, I told her before I have some technical issues, so I'm going to turn off my camera when I'm talking, but I wanted everyone to see me before I do that. Um, so I will go ahead and share my screen. And please let me know if everything looks good after I do so. Is everything good? All right, perfect. So. Good afternoon, everybody. As Laura said, uh, I'm Burja Koshar. I am from the Heliophysics Science Division at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, I was also a former postdoc with Aurorosaurus. And um, today I want to talk to you guys about NASA's brand new citizen science project called Spritacular, uh, which launched in October of 2022. Um, this image here, you know, giving this talk to our source ambassadors, I thought you might appreciate this. This is also one of my favorite photos by Mike Hollingshead. Um, the reason this is one of my favorite pictures is because uh, it encompasses all my research interests in one shot, um, sprites, lightning, and aurora. Today, I'm specifically going to be talking about sprites. Um, which are these fascinating optical phenomena in Earth's upper atmosphere. And before I proceed, I want to acknowledge my team, uh, GIUA, which is, uh, he's been my co-I in this project, and my volunteer team, Joseph Bohr, Sean Simmons, and Rachel Lenz. And I also would like to thank Ensemble Consultancy with um, helping uh, of the development of the website. So before we move forward, I always like to say, we are going to talk about sprites, but not the soda that you think of. So I think you got that by now. So when I uh, first started in this field, I thought we knew everything there is to know about lightning. So as you all know, it's one of the most commonly observed phenomena and there are about millions of flashes occurring daily all around the planet. But um, despite its familiarity, we still don't understand some very basic things about it. First question that comes to mind is, how do thunderstorms charge up? Well, uh, we know quite a bit about it. Um, we know it got something to do with water droplets bumping into ice crystals. And um, however, the charging, the details, the microphysics of this charging of the thunder clouds is still somewhat unclear. Well, once we charge up the cloud, how does the lightning start inside a thunderstorm? Well, there are decades of measurements of electric fields inside the thunderstorms, but um, the electric field values that we get are not even nearly close to what we need to initiate a spark at that altitude. Well, once you get the lightning going, how does it manage to travel so far through the air? And actually one of the longest single bolt that was recorded was about 440 miles, and it was recorded in South America in 2018. For lightning channel to travel, it continuously needs to break down the air in front of it so that the current will continue to flow. We all know that air is an insulator. To be able to uh, pretty much make the electrical current flow, we need to convert an insulating material into a conductor. I mean, this sounds like a pretty neat trick. How does it actually manage to do that? And the last question in lightning research is, what the heck was that? So the more and more we study lightning, we keep uh, coming across this new phenomena that we don't know. The prime example of what the heck was that is this. Um, I hope some of you in the audience actually recognize this. This is a spectacular image of Sprite uh, showing amazing detail. This was taken by Nicolas Escura from France over Gulf of Lyon in September 2, 2022. Um, so sprites occur about thunderstorm systems at an altitude of about, about 90 kilometers, I would say, and they're occurring right at the edge of space. They are large scale electrical discharges. 
And the event that you see here is actually quite large. So their lateral extent tends to be about five to 10 kilometer. And their vertical extent up and down is about 50 kilometers. So the atmospheric volume that is electrically and chemically affected by these events are thousands of cubic kilometers. So the question is, how on earth we missed something this big until recently? It actually seems like we missed quite a bit. Sprites are just one of many. Um, the region of space above the troposphere, the altitude range of 20 to 100 kilometer is sort of like an electrical zoo that is powered by the thunderstorm systems below. So due to their transient late nature lasting almost like a fraction of a second, we collectively refer to these events as transient luminous events. The word luminous comes from the fact that they all emit light, even though they're in different colors, this word luminous comes from them transient because they are very fast. So that's why we collectively refer to them as transient luminous events. Um, as you can see here, they all have different morphologies, meaning that they all look different. They all have different time and spatial scales and their physical mechanisms are different. But one thing that is common for all is they are connected to the electrical activity in the troposphere, in the thundercloud altitude. So to highlight a few, there are gigantic jets and blue jets, which initiate from the cloud tops and propagate outward. Gigantic jets actually are these massive electrical bridges. They connect the tops of the thunderstorms all the way to the ionosphere. Blue jets sort of terminate at an altitude 40, 50 kilometer, and that's how we kind of distinguish the two. Halos are these pancake-shaped large-scale ionization waves that form in the ionosphere. They usually propagate downward, and they are kind of mostly preceded by an ELF, which is another wave of ionization that expands at the base of the ionosphere radially outward. They are very, very fast, and they are um, they happen because of the electromagnetic pulses coming from the lightning flashes. So this ELF halo sprite, they can usually happen in sequentially in consequence. So what I mean is sometimes when you're trying to image sprites, you might have a halo in the image, or you might actually see an ELF expanding prior to seeing the sprite event. So talking of sprites, sprites are bidirectional. They usually start downward motion, ball of light descending downward, and then from the core, we have negative streamers shooting upwards. So if you were to look at a high-speed video, which I'm going to show you guys uh, pretty soon, they almost look like fireworks, and that, that's kind of what got me hooked up in this field to begin with. So to show you guys a few examples, um, there was this one footage released by the Gemini Observatory that is uh, located in Mount Kea in Hawaii. And they released this footage to show an example gigantic jet. However, I got this footage and I looked into it and I went through it frame by frame. But, and, I, and I identified not only one jet, almost three jets and multiple sprites and the gravity waves were also visible. I wanted to kind of go through with this with you so we can take a look at them. You guys can see thunderstorms appearing here close to the horizon of the observatory. And you guys can see lightning flashes. Do you see my cursor? I yes, do. Oh, okay. Maybe some people do. Um, Virgie, you also, uh, after this, you do have a question or two in the chat. And okay. um, if that's okay with you to, uh, to pause. Oh, but okay. Please go yeah, ahead. sure. It's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, sounds good. Is it okay if I answer the questions at the end? Yeah, that's totally fine. Okay, perfect. So, all right. So I think this video is right now, this is the gigantic jet that they actually showed from this footage, but you guys can see these very faint ripples in the air glow layer and a very faint sprite that appeared and disappeared here. And another gigantic jet shortly after the first one, there is another sprite here in the corner. And then another sprite right next to it with actually a halo on top. And I think the last one, 
is going to be another jet. Uh, this is kind of the hidden behind the clouds, but I'm assuming that's another jet. So I'm just gonna let this play, but what I wanna mention is usually people overlook these events. When you capture a footage, looking through it frame by frame and trying to identify these events are so important because they're so fast, you can easily miss a lot of them. So this was the image that they released, but there are many, many uh, TLEs actually observed in this 53 second. I accelerated this, this was a 53 second footage. All right, I will move on to the next one. So, um, as we talked about it earlier, uh, lightning is one of the most commonly observed phenomena. Uh, I would say there are more than 2,000 active storms throughout the world, and they produce on the order of 100 flashes per second. Um, so the global occurrence rate of TLEs is estimated to be about one per minute, and they have been detected over the land and oceans, and they have been seen in Europe. They have been observed from North and South America. Asia, and they have been observed over winter storms in Japan, Australian continent, covering most parts of the globe. So if we look at the here on the uh, plot on the right, we are looking at the um, occurrence rate of some of the major TLEs. Um, so these events were recorded uh, by Ishul Instrument on board the Formosat 2 satellite that operated between 2004 and 2010. Um, as you guys can see, TLEs are mainly occurring between 40 north and south latitudes. And the most frequently observed type is ELSE. And uh, gigantic jets, as you guys, you guys can see in plot D here, they are pretty rare. And uh, sprite and halo occurrence rates are pretty close together. This kind of signifies that, as I mentioned, they are usually accompanying sprites. So that sort of explains why they are their occurrence rates are uh, pretty similar. And uh, just another thing that I want to mention before moving forward is just the fact that lightning occurs all around the globe. We can see all different types of TLEs, and this will allow us in the future um, to grow our project up to a global scale if we can do outreach and communication effectively. So I have some high hopes. So... Um, so there has been many eyewitness reports of TLEs and sprites, I would say going back to a century. However, the scientific quest for these events did not start until the incidental capture while testing a, a low light level TV camera in 1989 by Franz et al. So the event recorded was very brief. It lasted less than 30 milliseconds. And you guys can see here the sprite elements like these two luminous blobs were vertically extending above the thunderstorms. So after their discovery, um, there have been many observational campaigns um, dedicated to pretty much documenting them. Uh, sprite 94 was one of them that was organized by Sam Minetal from University of Alaska, and they captured the first color image of sprites. As you guys can see on the image on the right side here, um, they are dominantly red in color with blue tendrils. And the, the future spectroscopic studies uh, show that these emissions are caused by excitation of molecular nitrogen. Specifically, the red color is from first positive nitrogen and the blue color is a combination of second positive nitrogen and first negative N2+. <clears throat> so as I, as I mentioned earlier, they are very dynamic and they are also morphologically complex. I would like to show an event here captured uh, by a high-speed camera that is capable of recording at 100,000 frames per second. So this is not a typical DSLR. This is a very specialized, pretty expensive high-speed camera, which can... Um, it has a very high time resolution so they can actually record the motion of these elements, which we call streamers, which actually make up of the whole event. And you guys are gonna see this. So after the parent lightning, the parent lightning flash, we see these luminous balls descending downward and splitting into many, many pieces. And as the event progresses, the central core gets really bright 
And we see these other luminous balls shooting upward from the sprite core. So this final streaky image that you guys see here is taken by a DSLR camera, which kind of represents um, the, the effect of long exposure and not enough time resolution. So I will talk about this a little bit later, but this is sort of like the if you were to do long exposure on the tail lights of a fast moving car in the highway, you will see these tail lights being like a streak. So this is the final result that people usually capture with the SLR is result of, of that. It's the long exposure and not time enough time resolution. But actually, I'll play this one more time. They are extremely dynamic, start as a ball, propagate downward first, and then gradually becoming brighter and brighter, and the negative streamers propagating in the opposite direction upward. And we also see these collusions and merging, but we cannot really name them as collusions because we are not 100% sure if those collusions actually happen. The only way to verify that, if we were to look at this in 3D, they code this from three different di uh, dimensions with a high-speed camera, then look at it from different perspective. That's the only way we can actually say they're colliding and merging. So in the 2D, that's how we see it, but that's not necessarily what's happening. So um, another thing I want to say is the sprites, they actually come in many different shapes and sizes. Uh, this is solely based on their appearance. They don't really imply any physics, but we call them carrot sprites, which is the very first one in the bottom here. We also call them column sprites, which looks like these little streaks of columns. And we have angel sprites. It almost looks like this sprite has wings here. And we also have um, jellyfish sprites, which are usually these um, massive clusters with a halo on top. In this specific frame here, this is actually another special type, which is a dancing sprite. Dancing sprites pretty much, um, they happen one after another in a very short period of time about the storms and this um, photographer here managed to capture two of them in one frame. So it's literally, when you look about, if you were to see this in real time, it's like a bunch of sprites turning on and off in a very short period of time. And we call them dancing sprites, which is a current active area of research. So one another thing that I wanted to say is, I mentioned this earlier too, I put a picture of elf and halo here. And the reason being, Sprites are usually preceded by elves and they're very hard to catch because they're really, really fast and you need to know exactly where to point and look to capture an elf, but they are captured by the observers. And at Halo, even though these events can be observed standalone, they are usually associated with Sprite, meaning that you can see an elf and then halo occurring and then the sprite event following it. So if you if you go sprite chasing and if you happen to catch these in your little video footage that you record, don't be surprised. It's a common thing to observe them all together. So as I mentioned, there's a, another video here. We've seen this, but to the human eye in real speed, they are literally a flicker of light. So they, they propagate with speed up to the fraction of a speed of light. So even though, I mean, people say, can we see this with naked eye? Um, that's one of the most commonly asked questions. If the conditions are right, yes, you can. Meaning that if your eyes are dark adapted and the, the event is pretty large and bright and it's pretty close to where you are, under those circumstances, some people actually have seen this with naked eye, but it is pretty challenging to, to do so. So if you wanna capture them, as I mentioned earlier, the home for this phenomena is the mesosphere. So you're looking up about the storms if you were to photograph these events. So one thing that you wanna do is you want to actively monitor the radar, pretty much look at active large scale thunderstorm systems around you. So remember that the storm, to, for you to be able to see TLEs or sprites, the storm does not have to be very close to where you are. It can be up to 150 or 200, 250 kilometer away, and you can still see sprites happening above them. So if the storm is close or overhead, 
it's not good for two reasons. Number one is if the storm is in your vicinity, because these events are produced by very powerful positive CGs, th those are the ones that shake your uh, shelves or your glassware in your house. So those are the ones that usually create these events. You don't want to be anywhere near them. So it is, you need to be in a safe distance. If you hear the thunder, you, you just need to go inside. It's too late to take a look at them. And if the storm is overhead, you know, because your view of about the storm is obscured, you're not gonna see them anyway. So the, the best way to look at them is the storm is either below your horizon or it's pretty far away. You just see this diffuse glow from the lightning flashes is a prime place to be if you wanna go sprite chasing. You're able to capture them with a typical off-the-shelf DSLR camera uh, that is capable of recording 24 to up to sometimes 30 frames per second. Usually the way people view them is when you, if you have a chance to see the storm flickering, if you see many, many flashes, you can just look off the distance on the right or left side of where those flashes are and point your camera and start getting little footages. People usually, those fascinating images they post are either ripped off of a video or when they see a lot of flashing in a storm, they set their camera in burst mode and they capture a lot of pictures all at once and they sift through them to see if they captured anything. So taking images of sprites is not like pointing your camera to a tree and just taking a snapshot. Because these are very fast events, they people usually either do burst mode or they record a little footage like I showed you from that Gemini cloud camera. And then you go through that footage frame by frame to see if you actually captured anything. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about the physical mechanism of sprites. So, um, we, so what really actually powers them? So in the past, the possible occurrence of these large scale discharges in the mesosphere, um, currently the, the events that we refer to as sprites was um, theoretically anticipated by a Nobel Prize winner, C.T.R. Wilson in 1925. So he first recognized that the, the electric field due to thundercloud charges decreases with altitude as one over R cube, which is this solid line on the left plot here. On the other hand, he realized that the conventional breakdown threshold field, which is shown with EK here, decreases more rapidly due to its proportionality to the exponentially decreasing air density with altitude, which is shown by the dashed line here. As you can see, these two lines intersect at about 75 kilometer. So about that intersection point, is the region where electric field due to thundercloud charges exceeds the conventional breakdown threshold field, which is the field required to create a spark. And that's the altitude where we today see sprites the most. The most common initiation altitude is 75 kilometers and up. This was theoretically anticipated in 1925. However, this field did not start still until 1985. Sorry, 1989, I'm gonna correct that. So um, I've been talking about different types of lightning flashes and what causes sprites. I wanna talk a little bit about that here. So not any lightning discharge will actually lead to formation of sprites. When you look at those thunderstorms, all of those flickering flashes in the center of the storm are typically negative cloud to ground discharges. As I mentioned earlier, the ones that are capable of producing sprites are the positive type, which are much more powerful and they are much rarer than the negative cloud to ground discharges. So when I say positive and negative, uh, we look at pretty much very simplified figure of the charge distribution inside a cloud. So most thunderstorms pretty much have a bipolar charge distribution. They have a main negative layer and a main positive layer. And majority of cloud to ground discharges, as I mentioned, carry this negative charge from cloud to ground. And very few of them, less than 10% of them actually carry the positive charge from cloud to ground. So I'm repeating, 
I'm repeating myself, I know, but sprites are specifically caused by positive CG lightning discharges that are more powerful than negative CGs. So we need the right ingredient. <clears throat> so how does this really happen? So when the lightning flash pretty much transferred this positive charge to the ground, the air above the clouds will feel this change. Pretty much it results in an electric field pointing downward. It causes a voltage difference in the upper atmosphere. So this voltage difference is pretty much the primary reason for initiation of sprites. In summary, the charge motion caused by lightning makes the sprites. So sprites are in a way children of lightning. So in scientific literature, that's why we typically say every sprite event has an associated parent lightning. So lightning can occur by itself without generating a sprite, but sprites cannot occur if there is no positive cloud to, cloud to ground lightning discharges happening from that specific storm. And we also talk about this early earlier. Um, sprites, as I mentioned, they propagate with very fast speeds, a uh, fraction of the speed of light. So in a regular TV camera, um, the frame rate is about 33 um, milliseconds. So if you were to capture sprites with that, the image on the top left here is what you would get. This streaky look of sprites, the just long streaks. However, as you go down in exposure time, you see that sprites are actually composed of very fast propagating balls of light. In the 0.05 millisecond picture here, you can see that those balls are actually descending downward and you don't have that streaky effect as much. Um, so if you pretty much the, the effect that we are seeing here, the, the streak effect is pretty much the same thing as I mentioned that you would get if you capture the tail lights of a fast moving car on a highway with a long exposure. You would see this tail light extending like a streak. That's not really how it looks. It's just car is moving too fast and you have long exposure and not enough time resolution to be able to capture that. So there is also laboratory streamers that we can generate in, in, in the ground. And um, they are also imaged, but they propagate much faster in nanosecond scales. If you look at the bottom images here, there are four frames. The one on the left is the exposure time is 300 nanoseconds and you get that streaky look. And as you go down the exposure time all the way down to one nanosecond, you see that those balls of light is actually what's cre creating that streaky effect. So there is a remarkable difference between laboratory streamers and streamers that we observe in sprites. And pretty much this resemblance was what um, caused us to take the direction of explaining them in the form of streamer discharges. And that's how we develop our models to study their physics and dynamics. So, um, so I said this uh, sprites pretty much, st we started studying them in 1989 when they were accidentally uh, discovered. But the, the biggest question here is, was this actually the very first time humanity has ever encountered these optical phenomena? The answer to that question is a big no. Um, as a matter of fact, there have been numerous eyewitness reports dating all the way back to 1800s. People described their reports as discharge assumed the shape similar to roots of a tree in an inverted position. There were some others talking about it as a weak stream of reddish hue. This was even seen by a um, lot of NASA pilots, but many of them were uh, not reported, which kind of makes me think or believe that they were um, not reported because of the fact that they were maybe worried about losing credibility. Because like I said, when you're a pilot, when you see something like that, and when you come back and say, I saw a flash of light in the sky, that might not sound very good about your you know, condition maybe at that point. So I think many of those were not reported back then because of primarily losing credibility. So in short, I would say um, this field of research is really no stranger to citizen science. Uh, we are just a little bit delayed in its acknowledgement. 
Um, in, in 2021, an opportunity presented itself for us to start a new citizen science project that will um, aim to collect observations of sprites and other TLEs. We call it Spritacular because sprites are spectacular. So that's where the name comes from, if you're wondering. So some of our project goals are establishing a citizen science community by leveraging existing enthusiasts. Uh, one of the groups that we closely work with is international observers of upper atmospheric electrical phenomena. The, actually, the admin of this group was our, uh, when we were designing the project, he volunteered his time and worked with us, which we really appreciated. There are multiple storm track communities that we would like to tap into, but we are just scratching the surface and there is just a lot more work to do about this. And uh, also with this project, we would like to improve knowledge of physical quantities per pertaining to sprites, such as their types, altitude of formation, properties of their lightning flashes, and, and hopefully drive new scientific knowledge from the reports that we collect. And with this project, we are going to establish the first ever event catalog of TLEs. And um, this is, I would maybe say, citizen science-based event catalog, because there are some out there based on some uh, past missions. But this will be the first citizen science event catalog of TLEs. And it will be an invaluable ground-based resource for um, TLE research. Another goal of ours is to establish a collaborative bridge between the communities of citizen science and the scientists studying this. And uh, through our website, we hope to provide training and educational materials to citizen scientists. And hopefully, this might be a little far stretch, but providing support to planetary missions. Some of you might know uh, sprites are actually recently observed in the Jupiter's atmosphere by Juno mission. Of course, this is artist's conception here. This is not necessarily how they look, but this is just a kind of how they imagined it would, but um, they are observed in other planetary atmospheres. So here is our project landing page, uh, which you can find at spritacular.org. Currently, we have 234 volunteers, 116 observations from uh, 11 different countries. The website has a streamlined observation upload experience. We allow users to choose uh, appropriate type for their observations. And this allows us to curate a labeled database that we will uh, use for AI and machine learning studies in the future. As a matter of fact, we have uh, one research that we are doing with the University of Puerto Rico through the EPSCoR program. They are actually developing an AI algorithm using our images in the database so that we can actually um, identify or tag them automatically and incorporate it in the website. So we have this user scientist interaction box pretty much in the form of commenting and discussing about individual submissions of the observers. We have this gallery or of uh, verified TLEs, which is, um, so we have verified and unverified gallery. However, the unverified gallery is only visible to admins and trained users. So we make sure the gallery of verified observations is pretty much verified by trained users or scientists in the loop so that we only present to the community valid and accurate observations. So if you want to learn more about uh, the project or sprites and others, we have this resources tab where you can have access to tutorials, trainings, and blogs. We don't have a whole lot there yet. We have two or I think three of them, but we are in the process of uh, generating some content that's going to be up on the website soon. One of them is actually one I'm working with, Stefan Hummel down in McDonald Observatory. He is an avid observer and he is writing a blog post with me about how to capture them, what kind of camera do you need, what kind of settings you need. And we are thinking that this will be a very good resource for the observers or people who want to actually start chasing them. However, um, I specifically wanted to talk about this um, training system that we implemented. Um, so this training system is pretty much when you become a user, you take this training and if you pass it with a certain threshold, your status is being upgraded to a super user. And these profiles are able to see 
our unverified gallery so that they can help with the verification pipeline. Because right now, this sort of falls on myself and my co-I. Uh, we are usually sifting through them and verifying them. However, uh, these users who are trained to do so help us verify them, which is actually very, very good. And this verification system is not only um, providing education to people, this is also giving alternative activity to non-observers because not everybody who becomes a member on our website not necessarily has a DSLR or know how to observe them, but they wanna learn about sprites. So actually taking this little quiz that we have on the website and passing it is a great way to, to do so. Um, so before we launched the project um, back in 2022, we created with the help of Heliophysics Division, we created many educational and promotional materials for Spritacular. So I am proud to say that I actually chased sprites with Paul Smith down in Oklahoma in 2021. It was an amazing experience. Um, the, we have a documentary that came out of it, um, which was released pretty much a year after in October, 2022, which is called Chasing Sprites. You guys can, um, I, I put a little barcode here or QR code. If you guys point your camera, you can have a, you can have a direct access to a blog post where I put links to all of these things that I put a snapshot here. So don't try to write anything down. You can access all of them with click of your mouse pretty much. So um, that documentary was also accompanied by a very educational blog post written by Lena Tran. Uh, if you have interest in learning more about it, please feel free to watch the documentary and read the blog post. They are very, very well done. And I am very thankful to be working with Joy and Lena on this. Um, so kind of, um, we, we, another thing that we did is during Halloween, because this project promotion came to end of October and for October 31st, being inspired by the spooky names of these TLEs being pixies and, you know, sprites and jets and all that, uh, they said maybe we can do a QA and a um, kind of during Halloween, not Halloween time. So we did a, we did a Q and A and that's also here. Like I said, you can access all of this through the QR code. And in that Q&A, maybe I might have answered some of your burning questions, which I'll get to after this presentation pretty shortly. And another thing that was really near and dear to me was we gathered little footages from um, very expert chasers that are in the international observer community. They recorded a little clip of themselves getting prepared and going chasing and talking about why they do it and how they do it. So we have a collection of that. We created a little mini documentary, I would say about Sprite Chasers. And I think this turned out really good. And that was also released as a part of the promotional campaign. And we also incorporated the word Sprite to the Goddard Glossary. And uh, this is also a YouTube short that explains Sprite briefly in about a couple of minutes. If you have interest in learning more about all those, go to the blog post and click on the links and look through them. This has been an exciting opportunity to form opportunity for me to exercise pretty much scientific communication and outreach. So I did my best and I hope you enjoy viewing them. So um, even though we only have 116 reports, there's already uh, some really interesting observations in our collection, scientific community that already picked up. So there are a couple of ongoing research efforts that actually utilize a spritacular database. So the first one is this green emissions of sprites, meaning that citizen scientists uh, often observe this green emission at sprite tops after the whole event has decayed. Um, this is currently a very hot topic that is uh, picked up by various research groups in Europe and US. Um, we presented our initial work at this uh, AGU fall meeting in December. Uh, we pretty much in this study focused on the intensity and time dynamics of this green emission. And the initial modeling results uh, of this study pretty much showed agreement that uh, with the assumption pretty much coming from the citizen scientists that this emission is primarily due to the forbidden transition of 5577 
atomic oxygen. So we are working on writing this up, which has been really exciting. And there's going to be another paper coming from Maria soon. She has also have some spectroscopic measurements of this green emission. And I'm looking forward to also that paper. Um, another very interesting work is this uh, purple, blue purple glows below thunderstorms. This is recently being observed by Paul and Stefan. Um, so these purple emissions typically seen above the thunderstorms. Um, they are referred to as blue starters or pixies. However, um, emissions from below is new and, and really interesting to the research community. So this type of emission is typically from the streamer zone. Um, therefore, it might actually be a signature of this failed streamer zone in a sense that it did not uh, convert into a leader and the channel did not extend out of, the, out of the cloud. So that's one assumption, but this is another very interesting thing that's uh, sort of being studied now, but we want to get into that a little bit more. Um, another research that we are doing right now is Citizen scientists uh, very frequently, concurrently, capture sprites with atmospheric gravity waves. You guys can see there is six great examples of this here. These banded structures, I think it's very, very visible in the last like bottom two, to bottom right corner. You guys can see these green and black kind of banded structure in the air glow layer. That is pretty much signature of uh, upper atmospheric uh, gravity waves. And in sprite literature, uh, people have been long speculating that uh, gravity waves can actually be seeding sprite initiation in under voltage conditions, since the uh, lightning electric field at that altitude is not enough to initiate the sprite. So there should be something seeding this initiation. So the, these, since these concurrent captures are pretty rare, uh, the, the studies in the, in the literature is very kind of limited. So therefore we, we, don't, we do not really understand the case studies are very, very scarce, but this wealth of observations from citizen scientists will allow us to further this work. And, and I'm super excited about it. This is a follow-up funding that we got to the Spritacular Citizen Science Project. And we are already working on this and hoping to launch a campaign actually for multi-point observations for altitude triangulations. So as we showed here, um, citizen scientists are actually making significant ground-based observations that can um, help advance our scientific studies in the field of um, TLE. So I'm super, super excited about this. And um, I would like to thank our volunteer team and the developer team for their dedicated efforts I would like to thank Liz and Laura from Aurasaurus that you know they advised us when we are developing the projects and that project, and I can't be more thankful. Um, and I appreciate your time. Thank you for listening. If I talk too much, I'm sorry, but I will get to all of your questions. And we also have a Twitter account. If you guys can, if you if you want to follow us, you can scan the QR code, and that will also take you to the page. But um, thank you for your time. Thank you so much for you. Fantastic. Fantastic. That's awesome. We have a Thank lot you so of much. great questions because we're all very excited about this also. Um, does anybody so, want to jump in? Yeah, please feel free. I stopped sharing, but um, I will turn on maybe my camera now. Let me see. Okay, cool. So here I am. <laughs> All right, so how do you guys want me to do this? Do you want me to go through the questions there or Laura, would you like to ask them or people who are curious want to speak up and ask? I'm fine either way. I can go through the questions, but if folks want to um, ask their own questions, please feel free. Um, let's see here. I see a question from Chandrash. Uh, do you want to ask your own question or should I do it? I'll go in and ask because I know Chandrash is driving. Sure. Um, is there any particular direction in the sky that the sprites occur? So that's actually a really good question. That's actually one of the most challenging thing in sprite chasing is knowing where to look. 
So I always say that um, usually when you look at the radar, Chandrish, you see this large storm brewing. And if you have a chance to see layer, which shows the types of lightning occurring, so that region that's usually shown with light green or dark green where precipitation is more frequent, that's usually the unveil section of the cloud where the positive cloud to ground charges frequently occur from. So if I were if I were to have a radar and looking in the direction of the storm, so you would have to look in the direction of the storm to the section where that anvil part is and just point your camera about that part. So that would be the best way to do it. They kind of occur all around. You cannot exactly, that's kind of the biggest challenge. There's no way to know exactly where they're going to occur. They're usually displaced from where the um, flash also happened. So if you have a positive cloud to ground discharge happening, that doesn't mean that it's gonna happen right above it. They usually have a radius of 50 kilometer that they can occur. That's also one of the science questions that, that uh, people are still studying. What really causes this displacement? They have apparent lightning, but they're not right about it. Why do they get displaced from their parent flash? So, you know, there are multiple factors here, but the best thing that I would say, look at the radar, know the direction of the storm, and where those green regions is where you want to point your camera. Um, I hope I answered it well. Thank you so much. Um, Francesca, you had a question about after the camera catches the TLE. Do you want to ask yours? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Burku, for your great talk. Um, after the speed the camera captures the TLE event, how are the characteristic uh, quantities uh, such as uh, emission intensity, wavelength, etc., obtained? Um, so, so the first of all, you're talking about the high speed camera. So high speed camera, uh, they are usually only recording so black and white. They are monochromatic white light. But if you were to record it with the SLR, you're looking at the peak in the red and you're looking at the peak in the blue purple. So, but the blue purple is not caught by the SLRs that effectively, they're usually catching them in dominantly just red. So those are pretty much um, what I could, what I could tell. Uh, I mean, so in, in the DSLR, you're looking at the red and you're looking some blue, some of them can capture it effectively, but usually they're captured in red. Thank you. And I think Donna had a question about cameras. Donna, sure. do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I was wondering about uh, camera settings. Uh, and I have another question about latitude as well. I'm around 50 latitude, so uh, that's probably probably way too far north to see them. Um. So Donna, 50 is high, but um, if you have the right lens, that that you know you can you have a zoom lens or telephoto lens you can see pretty far out so if you have a storm that's happening i would say 250 or 300 kilometers below where you live and if you can point your camera above those storms you might potentially catch something so the good thing about sprite observation is like i mentioned the storm doesn't have to be very close to you so if you point south I would say up from 50, if you have something in the vicinity, you might get lucky with something, but yeah, 50 is pretty high and observations from that altitude is pretty rare, but I would say not never. I have seen a few, uh, you might, you might want to try your chance, but the settings wise, I have never captured one myself, I would say. So I'm not the perfect person to talk about camera. So that's why I am working on this with a camera expert to kind of get the details on this out in a blog post. Um, I would be maybe, I, would, I don't wanna give you any misinformation. So I would say maybe look out for that blog post that we're working on, which will clearly outline some of the necessary settings to capture it. Hey, thank you. This thank is fascinating. Thank you for sharing. Of course, yeah, thank you for participating. I appreciate it. 
I have one final question to kind of tie us all together here, sure. which is, do sprites co-occur with auroras and how do auroras and sprites influence one another? Okay, that is a very good question. So I would say, so the co-occurrences aurora is typically about 100 kilometers and up. Mm -hmm. So auroras occur in the higher up in the ionosphere and the particles come from the magnetosphere into the ionosphere interact with the particles and create that emission of light. But sprites are, they do not penetrate into the ionosphere. Reason being, I talked a lot about electric field establishment in the upper atmosphere and how this electric field is the primary driver of sprites. So when you go into the ionosphere, this electric field relaxes very fast. So that time scale is so short that sprites cannot happen above the 100 kilometer altitude because electric field will relax so fast that mm -hmm. breakdown cannot happen. So they are in that very interesting boundary of 100 kilometer below, cool. that's where they occur. But auroras are typically above that altitude mm -hmm. as particles penetrate deep into the ionosphere and create that emission of light. So they can co-occur, but they are in different regions. So the atmosphere and processes leading to their formations are very different. Thank you so much, Virgil. Um, Really quickly, we are heading close to time. So I wanted to give one final announcement, which is a big cheer for everyone here, because today, five years ago, the first modern paper on Steve was published. And I know there are a number of people here who were involved and who have been involved in Steve since. Um, and so big round of applause for everybody who was involved in all of that um, and just celebrating you all. And thank you so much. Um, I know we have some more questions from Liz. Um, Virgie, what is your time looking like? Do you have a few minutes to stay after or do yeah, you need yeah. to head out? Okay. Yeah, I can totally stay a few more minutes. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah. So um, Liz, did you have any questions? My uh, signal is pretty bad. I actually, I think Michael, if Michael had any questions, I'd go there first. I Well, okay, my, my question is uh, kind of what's been surprising you about the project so far, about the citizen scientists or anything like that? Um, so that's also a good question, Liz. So um, what's been surprising me is, first of all, I think I've known this a little bit from Aurorasaurus. I maybe it's not really surprising, but how amazing and talented they are and how much they know about sprites. So they actually read scientific papers and we have discussions on actually the science of sprites. And I was so amazed that they don't really have a master's or a PhD or bachelor's on this or anything, but they are so knowledgeable. And I was so amazed that I can hold scientific conversations with them. Um, yeah, this did happen to us during Aurorasaurus, but having this repeated through Spritacular has been mind blowing to me. And, and it's just like, it, I have so much respect for these people uh, who, who is doing this. So I would say that that's still exciting and surprising to me. I mean, I was under the impression that nobody really knew much about sprites, but they do know a lot. And, and, and it's just like tapping into that knowledge and exchanging information and data. It's just making it, I mean, it's getting me excited all over again about, about sprites because I took a break when I got on board with Aurosaurus. I kind of took a break from sprite research. My PhD was on sprites. Then I switched to Aurora. And now Spritacular, the, this opportunity kind of excites me back about my own background and field of research. So it's been it's been great so far, even though we are still a baby project, a couple of months old, but I had some very meaningful experiences with people. That's amazing. And I definitely, definitely feel that working with this crowd of people whom I learn from every single day. Yeah. Um, Michael, I think we haven't we haven't come to you yet. Do you have any questions for Berju? Yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for your for your great talk. Uh, uh, I think my question is already answered. Um, I, I um, raised the question if you were uh, or if if you are aware about the green emission on top of uh, uh, 
the uh, sprites um, uh, because I saw a video on, on YouTube uh, with images from uh, um, one of the uh, citizen scientists you mentioned. Uh, but yeah, as you said, um, you are aware of the phenomena and, and already uh, doing research on it. Yeah, the, the green emission actually has been pretty exciting. They, without knowing anything about it, they, they pretty much called them ghosts. Um, green emission due to atomic oxygen, you know, without knowing anything, they named it. But now we're looking into it more, they're actually right. It is uh, originating from atomic oxygen. Um, I don't want to speak for the other person's research who did the spectroscopy. I will just give a hint. Um, it is not just oxygen. Oxygen is dominant, but they observed some metals emissions from some metallic layer, which has been kind of pretty interesting, which makes me want to talk to more uh, people who are studying meteors and meteor deposition at that altitude, because somehow in the spectroscopy of sprites, they detected some metal emissions, iron, sodium, which is pretty interesting mm. and which is not involved in models that we develop to study sprites. So yeah. all of this can really become a perfect input for modeling studies. And I, and I cannot be more excited about this green emission. So um, the, it, it's, it's, it's been brought to the field by them. And this is another going to be another example of citizen scientists discovering something new in this field of research. And, and I would say this is just one of them. There are many more coming, and these observations are so valuable, shedding light to a lot of questions that we have uh, in this field, and they're going to be very supplementary. So I am so excited about the future of this project. There's going to be a lot more coming. And this is going to be another example of uh, people making discovery in another field of research, just like the Steve. Virgie, you've yeah, got you. me about ready to go storm chasing right now, and it's <laughs> nice outside. <laughs> the sky is out. Does anybody else have any other questions for Virgil? And um, also feel free to email me if if you have something coming up later on. Uh, I will put my email here in the chat. I will answer as much as I can. Um, just, you know, feel free to reach out to me if you have questions about anything or if you want to be notified, you know, I can try to tell you guys when we put that blog post about how to actually capture them, necessary camera settings and all that. So please feel free to reach out if you want any information about anything. So yeah. I'll do my best to help out. And please do keep us posted on that as well, Virgie. We'll put it out to everybody. Um, and for those of you who have friends who are storm chasers, please share Spectacular with them. Uh, because I'm sure they will be as excited as we are. Um, Liz, since her apologies as well, her car, her uh, call dropped um, as oh, she is driving no. through uh, through a service uh, tunnel. So um, no problem. <laughs> thank you so much, Virgil. I'm gonna go. Yeah, on and... I mean, oh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and listening what I have to say. And like I said, if you guys want to talk about anything, sprites and TLEs. I'm here to help you guys out or elaborate anything further, but thank you. It's been, it's been a joy for me to speak with you guys and thanks for your patience and listening to me. Thank you, Virgil.